Our ceremony this afternoon begins in silence. Please stand. Special word of welcome to everyone as we gather to <clears throat> celebrate the sacred passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, welcome to all our visitors, welcome to parishioners from Lord Parish who may be joining us this afternoon. And, uh, and let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery. He who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to those joining us online. We pray with you as you pray with us. In the first reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophet Isaiah foretells the suffering of Jesus. In the second reading, we hear what the sufferings of Jesus meant to the early church community. The gospel is John's account of Jesus' passion and death. You may be seated for the reading of the gospel. first reading is a reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, and rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him and kings set stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. A man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet... Ours were the sufferings he bore. 
ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace. And through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich. Though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth, the Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in astonishment, he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty. For surrendering himself to death and letting him himself be taken for a sinner, while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord.
second reading is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was a son, he learnt to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became, for all who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. like to be seated. The Passion of Jesus according to John. Part 1. Betrayals and Capture. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden into which he went with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place also, since Jesus had often met his disciples there. So Judas brought the cohort to this place, together with guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing that everything that was about to happen to him, Jesus came forward and said, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they moved back and fell on the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its tribune and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews. 
it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace. But Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the doorkeeper, and brought Peter in. The girl on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you another of that man's disciples? He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly for all the world to hear. I've always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I've said nothing in secret. Why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is some offence in what I said, point it out. But if not, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As, Simon's, as Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at once a cock crowed. Trial and Revelation. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to Praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the Praetorium themselves to avoid becoming defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If he were not a criminal, we should not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourself and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, we are not allowed to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Did you ask this of your own accord, or have others said it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent my being surrendered to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom does not belong here. And Pilate said, So you are a king? Jesus answered, It is you who say that I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Truth, said Pilate, what is that? And so saying, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him. But according to a custom of yours, 
I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release, to release for you the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, not this man, they said, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a bandit. Rejection and the cross. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged, and after this the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and slapping him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you and let you see that I can find no case against him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to be put to death, because he has claimed to be son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me at all if it had not been given you from above. That is why the man who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jews shouted, If you set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated him on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabata. It was the day of preparation, about the sixth hour, he is, here is your king, said Pilate to the Jews. But they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king except Caesar. So at that, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side, Jesus being in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the Jewish chief priest said to Pilate, you should not write King of the Jews, but that the man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. 
His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, the words of scripture were fulfilled. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. That is what the soldiers did. loving to the end. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and so that the scripture should be completely fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the wine on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is fulfilled. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. faithful disciples and the aftermath. It was the day of preparation and to avoid the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead, and so, instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, through evidence, and he knows that what he says is true, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fulfill the words of scripture. Not one bone of his will be broken. And again, in another place, scripture says, they will look to the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bowed it in linen cloths with the spices, 
following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in this garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Many of you may know of Steven Spielberg and more so the movie that he produced in the 90s, uh, Schindler's List. Uh, Steven Spielberg gave a talk at our um, theological college in Chicago some years ago and talked about what he had done with the profit he'd made from that film. He'd used the money to fund a program to interview the survivors of the Shoah, the Holocaust, who were still alive in the 90s, mostly elderly people by now. They wanted to capture their memories. Uh, some 50,000 interviews were funded across the world. Spielberg spoke at this dinner about some of the early and unrefined um, learnings and he had discerned two particular patterns that wasn't organized because they were happening all over Europe and there was not communication between families but two very common threads were emerging and the night before families were separated they tended to gather and make a promise that there would be a reunion, they would meet again after this horror had passed. They chose a place. It was usually somewhere not their own home. They didn't expect that it would exist. They would choose something like the town hall or a relative's farm in the country. But a promise that amidst all the destruction, we see scenes of that today in Ukraine. But amongst all that destruction in that Second World War, they would meet again. They had a goal, a vision, a hope. The other pattern that emerged was that many parents would sew into the lining of their children's clothes uh, something, uh, sometimes a few coins, not because that would be a valuable amount of money, but a few coins or some buttons or a tiny little uh, brooch or, or something from the family. The point of that was that any time the children could touch that cloak or that jumper or whatever and feel that they were remembered, they were known, they were loved, These little spontaneous actions that arise from the human spirit. But when we think today of the passion of our Lord and the gift of that passion to us, we might see similar rhythm for us. That in his dying and as we await his rising, the Lord did give us a destination, a place of reunion, a place to journey towards amidst all the things that can happen to us in life, the daily struggles and sometimes the very tragic struggles. But amidst all of that, we have a destination, a place to meet, and a Lord who will welcome us. That's one of the promises of this day. Despite death, despite suffering. And we too have little mementos. They're not buttons or coins sewn in, 
sewn into our uh, clothing. But for us in the Christian community, the ultimate memento, the ultimate reminder that we are loved, that we're remembered, that we're cherished, that we belong to a family is each other. We are like the living memento to remind people going through struggles, people going through illness, people feeling outside the community, people who are lost, people who are struggling, people who are just needing encouragement for the ordinary rhythm of life. We are the memento that is meant to be the, the encouraging presence in the lives of others. When your brothers and sisters see you, let's pray that they see that they're important, that they're loved, that they're welcome, that they're not forgotten. Today is a, a very solemn day, but let's see in this day our hope for eternal life and for each day's journey. The general intercessions conclude the liturgy of the word. After each petition, there is a period of silent prayer, followed by the prayer said aloud by the celebrant. Let us pray for the Holy Church of God. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church, spread throughout the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our most holy Father, Pope Francis. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all living things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us also pray for our Bishop Patrick, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. 
Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognise the signs of your parenting and love and witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, both at the federal and state level. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lie every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and the freedom of religion may, through your gift, be secure. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray to God that God may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strengthen of strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Veneration of the Cross. We come to the, now to the veneration of the cross. The simple cross embraces the whole of the Paschal mystery. In venerating the cross, we acknowledge this and we also acknowledge our own willingness to take up our own cross each day and unite ourselves with the total self-giving of Christ. The cross is brought through the church and unveiled in three stages with the priest and the people singing each line.
The Adoration of the Cross, as advised by the Archdiocese, is a communal one this afternoon. It will be partly in silence and partly in uh, Teze chant. join. Holy Communion. As soon as veneration of the cross is finished, the altar is covered with a cloth, with a corporal and missal placed upon it. The celebrant brings the blessed sacrament from the altar of repose, while the people all stand in silence. The celebrant places the tuborium on the corporal. As the celebrant reaches the altar, any extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist who are to assist in the distribution of communion move to their places at the side of the altar. Holy Communion is the third part of our Good Friday ceremony. Jesus giving of himself on the cross 
and his giving of himself to us in communion are two facets of the one act of redemption. As the Blessed Sacrament is brought from the altar of repose, we stand in silence. My sisters and brothers, at the Saviour's command, and formed by the teaching of Jesus, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Communion will be brought to the people in the choir and then distributed at the back of the church for those who are standing. And for all others, please, we'll have two points at the very front of the sanctuary. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are we who share the Lord's life at this, the Supper of the Lamb. easiest if we approach communion from the sides and return by the central aisle.
Let us bow our heads to pray. Almighty, ever-living God, you have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of Christ. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. A ceremony this afternoon ends in solemn silence. You may stay for a time and silently pray. There is to, is to be no touching of the cross and you are asked to maintain the silence until you are well outside of the church. As you leave the church, the annual collection for the support of the church in the Holy Land will be taken up. There is a container for the collections. Any Project Compassion boxes and envelopes which are still to be handed in may be left in the church foyer. Let us stand. We have our blessing and then we leave in silence. The silence is important because the journey of these three days is not finished. We find our voices again at the Easter Vigil and on Easter Sunday. The Lord be with you. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the sure hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us depart in silence.